however you are and whenever you are, welcome good souls to the planet and beyond. This is Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Tonight, my guest is Jeremy Nori to, Nori to discuss his film, Don't Call Me Bigfoot. <laughs> kind of a humorous title and, uh, and one that I think really, really gets the root of all the controversy, if you will, about what Sasquatch is, who Bigfoot is, uh, where does this phenomena, cryptid, whatever you want to call it, come from? Is it a metaphysical apparition or just a human cousin? So just stay tuned. We will be speaking with Jeremy in a moment. My heart, I just want to share, goes out to, to, to all the victims uh, right now of, of hate crime, um, as well as to all the victims of the opportunists who have taken advantage of a righteous cause and vandalized and harmed. Um, so everyone out there, please, please just keep love in your hearts and be safe and be kind to one another. Uh, many of us this weekend were paying attention to SpaceX launch, which was the first privatized space launch. And I think the symbolism of that moment during this period was extraordinarily powerful. Um, and it's, it's really exciting. I mean, th this is, I was having a conversation, not exactly our generation's Apollo 11, but something akin to it because it's the power of its symbolism is almost unspeakable because right now we're not talking about just another trip to space. What we're saying is that we have officially open the doors to interplanetary space travel. SpaceX, their, their mission is not just to dock with the ISS space station. Their mission is to go to the moon and ultimately Mars and beyond. And because a private company was able to accomplish these feats with more nimble craft, with less money, saving on cost overhead, it means that we'll be able to do more trips and yeah, we're going to have a space station on the moon within our lifetimes and likely we will all get the chance to see the first Martians uh, ever, as far as we know, depending on the ancient astronaut theory you subscribe to or don't. <laughs> so <laughs> I, perhaps in our lifetime, we'll get that physical evidence and, um, and we'll have the proof that we finally need, right? Uh, so as we go tonight, please share your thoughts and experiences with us during or after the show on facebook.com slash paranormal now radio or on Twitter at paranormal underscore now during tonight's show. You can comment in the comment sections on YouTube and Facebook, and we can share those with the audience, ask your questions of our guest or myself. And of course, for the YouTubers out there, you can watch this same video stream on youtube.com slash paranormal pop or on the Facebook page. Facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio. All right. Once again, let me remind you, those Paranormal Radio app lines are open tonight in the second hour. So if you want to call in and ask our guest your question directly, as opposed to comments, you can just call 85-KGRA-LIVE. That's 855-472-5483. Jeremy Nori is the producer of Sky Island Storytelling, director and co-producer, producer of documentary films, Cannabis versus Cancer, Cannabis and Your Doctor, I Want to Believe, Don't Call Me Bigfoot, which we'll be discussing tonight, and others. Jeremy, welcome to Paranormal Now. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you having me, Alan. Yeah, my, my pleasure. So as I mentioned to you a couple of times already, your timing was perfect. I'm glad that you know, we were able to connect because I've, I've been wanting to speak about Bigfoot for a long time. Uh, and so I, I watched your film uh, after your email and we, we had a, a brief discussion and I, I implore everybody to go out there and watch it. It's a, it's a really well crafted film. Uh, so Jeremy, how, how, how did you get involved in, in filmmaking in the first place? So that's actually a kind of a long story. Um, I was in the cannabis industry prior to uh, being a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I was in it for a long time and uh, near the kind of uh, one of the last things that I was doing in the industry was uh, events. And we started doing this kind of underground event and you could feel that it was something special. 
And uh, at that point in my life, I was more just a, a film fan, you know, mm-hmm. well, maybe even a fanatic if, you know, if I do. So um, I, I've watched so many things that, that I, I could kind of tell like what I liked about certain projects. And mm-hmm. I, I was a big documentary fan. And I also liked watching um, just talks and, and uh, videos that, you know, were, were interesting uh, experience stories mostly, you know. And uh, uh, in that, I kind of knew that what we were doing was special enough that it could maybe be a film. Mm-hmm. So we started shooting it and I began learning the process of, of filmmaking uh, because it was very difficult to make. Uh, you know, I thought it was going to be very easy, but it turned out to be a lot more difficult than I thought. And so uh, I basically uh, I had hired a crew and, and they were experienced in making like uh, commercials Mm-hmm. but uh, or, or you know maybe short short films maybe 15 minutes or something like that and what i was asking them to do was a lot uh more than what they had done in the past and so we had like a little bit of an experience of learning together where we kind of put put together this film and it what we made was ultimately about you know 45 minutes or so and i i liked it but it was like you know, I had to piece a lot of it together because it didn't tell quite a story like uh, Mm -hmm. a lot of other films do. And um, it was really difficult to get off the ground. I I knew a lot of people that uh, were having successful uh, film projects or or TV projects that I thought might be able to get my foot in the door, but it really didn't work out that way. And and there was a long period of time where I was just, you know, really trying to get my film uh, in front of the right eyes. And and it took us maybe like six years or so to make just the film because yeah. there were so many little ups and downs about this and that. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, I, I met um, one of the producers on our, our films, uh, like uh, – I believe he's one of the producers on don't call me Bigfoot, but he's definitely one of the producers on the cannabis films. And his name is Paul McMinn. And it was like a by chance thing where I I got a phone number of a friend of a friend. And I just kept pestering these people until they eventually got me in touch with Paul. Like literally the message was like, I'm too busy. Call my friend. He can help (laughs) you. And, and so I called him and, and, um, you know, I must have said the right thing to Paul because yeah. he has opened all the doors for me as far as uh, film projects. And mm-hmm. I had all these different subject matters that I'm just like interested in that, you know, could potentially be uh, film projects that other people wanted to work on. Right. So most of them were cannabis related. And, and why, uh, why is that? So, so like, you know, that's, that's the greatest deal of experience that I have is in the cannabis industry. I, I started out as like a big time fan of it and it was <laughs> and completely by a, legal by a fan. What do you mean by fan? So like, that's one of the things that people kind of take for granted now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's common knowledge that there's different kinds of marijuana and they can kind of mm-hmm. be aesthetically different, you know, from smelling like, you know, the same in some ways, but very different in, in a lot of other ways. And so that used to not be common when, when uh, pot was like illegal, you, you had a pot dealer and he had like good pot or bad pot. And and those were your choices <laughs> if you had a choice at all. And so uh, for the large majority of people, unless you went to Amsterdam, uh, you didn't really know that there was this world of like, you had heard of different kinds of names, but it, you didn't realize it was as kind of um, diverse as it actually is. Mm-hmm. And and so, like, uh, when I was fairly young, I, I went to Amsterdam with some of my friends to go to the Cannabis Cup because, you know, that sounds like the coolest thing when you're into cannabis, you know. And living in California, you know, we we're kind of like, you know, real deep with that whole culture and we think, Oh, you know, we know what we're doing. You know, we can hang with these guys if we go over there and you kind of think, you know what to expect, but you're also a little like, you know, we're from California, you know, 
I'm, I'm not sure you're going to impress us. I kind of heard that it's not that impressive compared mm-hmm. to what we're used to. And that's both true and not true, you know? So, yeah. and Paul and this person, Paul, so you were, it was sort of a lucky thing that the initial contact person kind of pushed you off onto somebody else. Cause that worked out in your favor. Oh, it really did. Yeah. And, and ultimately like where it's led to where I was able to do all these projects that were, you know, I never thought that I would be working on a Bigfoot film, you know, yeah. but that kind of just fell into my lap because it was one of the subject matters that one of my co-producers wanted to do. And that was something oh, interesting. OK. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the interesting things about that subject matter is as diverse as it is, there's not a lot of great films about uh, Bigfoot. You know, there's there's like a lot of films that have little parts that are good and, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is uh, sensationalized. You know, that's one yeah. of the things that I am not really a big fan of when it comes to uh, other uh, films about this subject matter. Cause mm-hmm. there's, you know, I like some of that stuff. I find it interesting and some of it's really funny, but um, I also am genuinely interested. I want to know yeah. what's true. I want to know it's fact. I want to know it's opinion, you know, and uh, the ominous music and the like looking for Bigfoot with the 3D or, or the night vision goggles or, and, and like never mm-hmm. finding him or like a lot of that for me, it's just entertainment. It's not really a serious approach. So I didn't feel the need yeah. to like have that in our film. You know, I, there, there are so many shows like that because, you know, in conversation, people say, oh, do you watch whatever show? I can't watch them all. There's just literally no time. Um, but, you know, on, on occasion, you're flipping through the channels and you see shows. And when I saw Hunting Bigfoot, I, I was like, what is this? It's right. It, all it is is a, a documentary about people hunting in the woods. And then they just talk about some some really <laughs> unscientific or things they just make up apparently on the fly about uh, Bigfoot theories or what. And it was just so far from the subject matter of Bigfoot, um, you know, and, and I'm so anti anyone. If you, if you believe Bigfoot is, is real the idea of hunting or, and, and attempting to shoot and kill someone like the, the fact that that's promoted on TV, it, it really disturbs me because to me, that's equivalent to hunting dolphins. Like we, right. we, we know dolphins are hunting apes. We know that they're they're conscious, they're self aware, they're not as intelligent, but they're still intelligent. They have emotions, they have family units. Um, and so to promote a show like that, I just thought it was so so dis- just disgusting and disgraceful, you know. Oh, absolutely. There's actually laws in certain states. Uh, there about, is now, yeah. Was it Georgia? Yeah. Was it one of the more recent states? You know, I'd have to look it up to okay. not sound uh, too ignorant about it, but mm-hmm. I, I think it's multiple states have uh, yeah. laws that are you know, um, either previously on the books or, or fairly, you know, recent um, mm-hmm. about the legality of hunting, um, you know, basic, basically a Bigfoot, you know? Right, right. Now, so, okay, yeah. do you think Bigfoot is real? So, so I think that there's so many different Bigfoot stories mm-hmm. that it, it's almost uh, as, well, I mean, I guess aliens are are like you're dealing with a greater probability number but like i do feel like you have a really high probability of one of these stories turning out to be based on something true you know and and it could be a primate you know like i'm not a hundred percent on uh, it has to be a human type creature um what do you so it, it could be a primate but not a not like a hominid so, like, one of the things that I encountered um, doing research for our film was that, um, y- you know, the Bigfoot culture is almost as interesting as Bigfoot uh, itself. There are kind of, like, you know, camps, so to speak. You know, you believe, like, a certain storyline, and you know, for whatever reason, like, you're diehard that storyline so um and like apparently it can get fairly ugly amongst uh, the arguments that happen between people about you know bigfoot is definitely some sort of a primate you know or 
a lot of people think Bigfoot is a human ape hybrid. Those seem to be the two majorly battling uh, concepts. Yeah. I think the, the re- I guess the way when I think about that, because um, we are all kind of hybrids anyway, right? Because the the, the human tree um, is much, or the hominid tree is much wider, dense, and diverse than we assumed twenty years ago. Um, there are so many species, um, that we know now that they've interbred. Um, right. So, yeah. so, I mean, it's kind of, so it's when I think of in terms of interbreeding species, it, it's more of like a gradual process, right? Oh, you know, honestly, your guess is as good as mine, right? The, the, the story is being told. We're kind of watching it unfold. Uh, as as we're uh, you know as scientists are releasing this information and we're all gonna you know getting privy to to reading about it but um yeah basically when i was young it was a different story you know you, you know like we said in the film uh kind of homo erectus was you know to themselves and and um neanderthals were you know to themselves and and they didn't intermix or interbreed and and now you're kind of seeing that's not necessarily a a hundred percent fact that that we're seeing evidence that they're and it makes sense when you think about it and like there's so few you know creatures at all any sort of human or ape type species Mm -hmm. you know it, it had to be pretty limited to to your choices especially sometimes for some people yeah. and so the interbreeding thing had to have happened but I, like that being said like i said i'm not you know committed to one side or the other as far as what bigfoot is everywhere in the world you know right. uh, so when you say everywhere in the world i mean do we have an idea uh, of how many different countries um, and, and when we say, when we say Bigfoot, it's under different names. Not every country calls it Bigfoot. And, and a lot of those are, you know, physically different sounding stories, even mm-hmm. though they're very similar, you know, there's, you know, differences in height and weight, mm-hmm. um, hair color. Uh, some of them are apparently smell, right? Like there's one called yeah, the skunk yeah. ape. Right. And, uh, there, you know, then, everybody then he, knows the abominable snowman. That's supposedly the Yeti, right? Yeah. So. yeah. Now, but many reports report it having a, a strong odor, right? Isn't that fairly so, universal? Yes. It's not like a hundred percent, but mm-hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, included more in certain, uh, certain ones that I've heard it more commonly talked about. Mm-hmm. And other ones, it's not talked about as commonly, but it is still talked about sometimes. Yeah. You when know? your co-producer asked you to do Bigfoot, did you, what was your reaction? So he said to me, uh, he's like, I've been doing research on what kind of film topics are popular. And he started telling me though different film topics. And mm-hmm. like, it was basically like almost all the things that I'm interested in. <laughs> and so I'm like, yes, yeah, I, I, I'm way into that stuff. And, uh, and I also find myself as like, um, I, I consider myself a somewhat of an expert because I like to watch all of the other films. And so in doing that, you end up um, kind of seeing a lot of information, you know, mm-hmm. it's almost like being a researcher because so many of those films are just uh, compilations of all the research that's been done. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I like also to watch debunk stuff mm-hmm. because I am a truth seeker. You know, I, I, I love the idea of all this stuff, but mm-hmm. I also, I've had enough of experiences where like, especially like film glitches and things like that, where you, you know, you think you have something, and then you stumble upon what it actually is. And it's like, oh, I should have known better. And you have that moment of like, oh, damn it. You know, like you, you just kind of go through your head and like, no, 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 no. It, it, it could still be this other thing. And, and then you, you kind of like one by one going, no, no, it's, you know, it's this easily explainable answer that I didn't want it to be. So uh, 
you know, I reserve that that also when I'm going into all these things. So, uh, do you do you entertain? I mean, you obviously ha- do entertain speculation, though, right? Because oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's as long as you make that clear, right? Things that might be completely outlandish sounding, if if it's you know, so. So we just did a documentary. Um, it's called Alien Contactee, a conversation with Dr. Turi. And, uh, and, and let me tell your audience, like, so uh, with independent filmmakers, especially with Amazon and a lot of other places, our uh, way of making money has become, like, really difficult. And so it really, really helps us to watch, like, the whole film all the way through and to rate and review it even if you didn't like it that much to to participate through it or or whatever Mm -hmm. it helps us a lot as filmmakers so so please do that um back to my movie it's it's a subject that is basically what you were just talking about this story from dr turi i love the story i don't know if it's a hundred percent true if you know you can watch the movie and he's got like four different experiences of, of uh, essentially like alien contact. And it's an amazing story. And, you know, there's part of me that believes it. Right. And, mm-hmm. and I listen to this, to him tell it. And like, you, you kind of, I was sitting there, you know, listening to him and he's telling me eye to eye. And, and I can tell, like, it, it feels like he believes it is true, yeah. you know? And so that is, is such a compelling thing when you're, you're uh, listening to a story. And, and, uh, well, as a, as a quick teaser for those who aren't familiar, what, what is the, the, the story of the so, film? So, so, he, so Dr. Tory is basically, he's an alien contactee. You know, he's French, so he's got this crazy accent. And uh, he, so part of how I was doing these films was I attended an event here and I live in big bear Lake, California. Mm-hmm. And we have an event called, um, alien, uh, yeah. Alien snow fest alien is snow what fest, it's yeah. called. Yeah. KGRA participates, participates in that. Yeah. It, it was, it was a great, it's a great event. And, uh, and I met Dr. Tory there and, and mm-hmm. in, uh, doing the event, he was one of the few people that like kind of communicated with me prior to even meeting me. He was a very nice guy. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that I kind of wanted to hear his, his full story. He's, he's like, uh, he's kind of like got this astrology angle and he makes like psychic predictions. Right. And he's been on coast to coast a bunch of times and he's, he's got books and, you know, like his, his story is like, uh, it's a, it's a great story and it's got like multiple different uh, angles. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, as a young child, he um, met the gray aliens. And, and a lot of it is interesting, too, because of how old it is. I think that some of the best evidence is prior to technology, uh, things that happened that seem true. And so, uh, you know, his story, it's, it's, it's about him, like, um, you know, kind of waking up and, and, and kind of having an encounter with, with these aliens as a young child. And like what that's like, he's very animated and, and telling, I can never do it justice compared to uh, right. him. Well, but, I mean, uh, yeah. One thing I've noticed, um, you have to, you have to do your best to intuit if somebody is, is being truthful. Um, a lot of people that I, that I speak to, you know, I try to feel like, do they, is it coming from a place in their heart? Like, is it, is there an emotional aspect? Um, because that's that's more difficult to fake, I think. Um, when people have had odd experiences, it, it usually kind of unnerves them. Even if it's an interesting and positive experience, it's a little unnerving. And you can kind of get that sense when you're speaking with somebody who has those experiences or an experience. Um, and then on occasion, you, you get the sense that someone is trying to convince you. Um, of something and be entertaining to you that there's an undercurrent there and it's not always easy to distinguish between those two things um but on on occasion uh you know i think i I listen to somebody on the show or someone i'll talk to off air and i just think 
you know, I, I faithfully believe them, you know, I don't know for a fact, right. But I, but I do believe in like, like Travis Walton, I, you know, I believe that that event happened. I believe he was abducted, um, but I just can't prove it, you know, but mm-hmm. I, I trust um, that, that he's telling the truth and, and the other eyewitnesses of that event. Uh, he's a good friend of Dr. Tories. Well, there, there you go. I, I, perhaps the those who um, are telling the truth would be more attracted to each other. Yeah. Um, we've seen in the field uh, or the many paranormal fields that those who are not honest people tend to attract to each other. And that's another uh, way to look for a red flag as well. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of the things for me is as, as I got deeper in a lot of the stories and you watch more of people talking a lot of people kind of like hung themselves uh, by kind of going down a road where I'm like, Oh, okay. I had full. Uh, one of the ones that I like to tell is uh, like, I, I, I kind of go back and forth with the whole alien and UFO uh, story where like, as a child, I believed it a lot more. And then there was mm-hmm. a period of my life where I was like, that's all fake. And then I remember, um, uh, a friend came over and he had driven kind of long distance and he had been listening to coast to coast and James Gilliland was on. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. And so mm-hmm. like, and I'm listening to, I, I, he's, he's telling me about it at first and I'm skeptical and I'm like, yeah, but what about this? And then he has a pretty legit answer for pretty, almost everything that I'm like saying mm-hmm. to the point where I'm starting to be turned by the end of our conversation. And he's telling me, yeah, it was like a replay. You could probably get this same, you know, thing. And I went and found it and I listened to the whole thing and it's an amazing show. And, yeah. uh, you know, by the end of it, I'm a believer again. But then I heard another interview eventually with him yeah. where I was like, oh, maybe I'm, maybe this guy isn't telling hundred percent the truth. Yeah. And, you know, it is what it is. I, okay. So that has come up on this show before. And, and I do think what happens is that people who start off 100% genuine, something happened, it's an event they're sharing. And then it kind of just took off. And the next thing they know, they're doing radio shows and they have a book. And then I think that they find themselves in a place where things were going along so fast. And then that they quit their job. I, I mean, this is very real. People will quit their job because they got a show on, on TV or a book and they're getting speaking as engagements and then things slow down and it's like, Oh my gosh, now I don't have, am I going to go back to that old career or am I going to keep with this paranormal thing I'm doing? Um, and I think that sometimes they start reaching, they start em- embellishing at, at, at best. Um, if somebody embellishes a little bit, okay, fine. You know, we're in the speculative field, but then it, for some, it goes beyond that. Um, and I think that's it's a it's a slippery slope. And I think a lot of people, good people, start off in that in that place. I think you're absolutely right. That's one of the things. One of the people we interviewed was talking about in uh, "I Want to Believe," and uh, he kind of brought it. We, we got on the subject of one of. So I assume you've seen "Mirage Men." The it's a a story about. Um, uh, Richard Doty mm-hmm. and uh, you know the the story claims that this ba- he basically drove this guy insane and the guy ended up killing himself that's kind of the narrative there's a little back and forth to whether that's entirely true or not but he he, he admits in the film to f- essentially faking UFO stuff to this guy and who knows who else, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is very controversial. I mean, you know, a lot of people really struggle with this one and people are very, it's one of those subjects where people are vehement about their position. All right. Yeah. So, so, so that's the subject, right? So then I start talking to him about, um, about it. And he kind of got on the subject of what you were just talking about. And, and he, he said that he sees it in their community Mm-hmm. That, um, you know, you, you got kind of laid it out right there that, that you had genuine, you know, an experience or whatever it was, was, you know, an authentic ex- experience or thought or, 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 you know, discovery or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. And uh, you began into this field 
with that, you know, authentic thing. And then somehow you got, you know, into a, a situation where you needed something new to continue this, you know, career lifestyle, whatever it is, right. you know, maybe for some people, it's just an ego thing. So of all the stories that you encountered, what, what was the most interesting story about Bigfoot that you heard? Okay. Well, so like in the movie, one of the guys told a story mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, from like another country and like Bigfoot was like fighting over a food and he picked up a, I think it was a tiger or something and like broke it over his head. Yeah. And it's a, that's a fun story. I don't, you know, really think that's probably exactly how that went down if it went down. <laughs> but uh, that was the funnest story. Sure. Um, yeah. But I, I uh, recently saw something that I liked. I haven't done any research on it, but I saw a picture of like, like essentially a fossilized hand. It looked like it had meat on it and bone. Okay. And it looked fake, I will say. But it also looked real enough to me to where i was like oh that's when i gotta i gotta look into, look into it yeah you know well, it, that, it reminds me of um i think it was in utah it was near a river there were alleged uh imprints of dinosaurs and and human footprints next to each other um i'm, I'm pretty sure this the science has not come in and said that that's legit um and that it's just geological artifacts that that, right. kind of, that just look like that you know, yeah. um, is that, do you think that in this case that that's what that is, that we're just, it's probably a fake. It, like fake. The, the large majority of stuff mm -hmm. is not going to be authentic because yeah. just, that's the law of probability. You know, that's just math. Yeah. What, what was the guy's name? I forget. I think it was Bob something. He, he had the, the, I think this was, this was early two thousands. Apparently had caught a, a Bigfoot and, and was in the freezer and he put out pictures on social media or on YouTube. Or I was on CNN. See, it, yeah, it got national yeah. traction. Yeah. I watched that. And you know what it was? It, it was uh, the same thing as a lot of the UFO stuff. It was like the National Press Club or, or, or whatever, uh -huh. one of those things. And, and, and I thought it was real. I was a believer. <laughs> Well, it was one of those. It was one of those moments where you you're like, maybe, yeah, maybe this is yep. the one. Maybe yeah, it yeah. absolutely was. Mm -hmm. Like you would, you see it on CNN, and you think, this. I mean, this was prior to fake news and all of this. Right. You thought, oh my god, this is for real. You know, they would never bring something on CNN without doing their research. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, it was probably considered more of a puff piece. Um, but still, it's like, don't highlight that, you know, find out if someone, if this is legit, if they're, you would think somebody would yeah. get eyes on it, you know? Yeah. Cause what you're doing is you are, even if you're approaching it, like it's a puff piece, you're helping that person out. You're helping the hoaxer out. Um, he made money. He was charging uh, visitations. Oh, and, oh yeah. He was oh, doing yeah. like tours as well. On the road. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. In your in your documentary filmmaking, did you did you come across anyone or communicate with anyone you thought, mm, uh, you know? Uh, okay. Right here. <laughs> now, there, there is another documentary film we can discuss in regard to that too. So so that brings me to a subject that like mm -hmm. I kind of personally went back and forth on uh, if I am admitting the, the whole truth. Um, there is, and I don't want to like get in trouble so i will be a little vague about it like we were in the film but there is a film i think and, and now from what i understand the tv show although i have not seen the tv show um but uh, there is like a shot essentially of a bigfoot face and maybe a few different bigfoot faces that is uh so we got these good cameras now. A well, lot. Uh, can I? I'll say the name of the film. It, it's it's finding, sure, sure. finding Bigfoot, right? Isn't that it? I believe it is. Yep. <laughs> and it's the, uh, it you know it's this shot that it, it looks like almost like uh, I don't know if you ever saw like Geraldo or one of these talk shows had these hairy guys on that have this disease where they grow hair on their face. They are mm -hmm. humans mm -hmm. with hair on their face, and that's basically what it looked like. Mm -hmm. You know. You're looking at 
this face and it's a hairy face and it looks very human. Yeah. And I, at first I'm like, it was on Netflix and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it was sold. That's where we watched it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at, at first I thought, oh my God, you know, is this what Bigfoot is? And I don't, you know, I don't remember if it was like a few hours or a few days or how long it was before I said to myself, that can't be real. Like that, that has to be something, right? you know, else. Um, uh, yeah. So, so if I recall the documentary correctly, uh, the person who was filming the documentary wasn't necessarily a believer, right? They were just documenting. So, the, yeah. from, from, I, so I have been told a number of things, but as far as I can tell, this person had some experience uh, prior to this that mm-hmm. some people would say is not authentic. Okay. And then, um, in addition to that, it was exactly almost like what we were just talking about that, like, some of his experience does seem authentic. So, you, as you know, m- let's say you saw some of the, the other stuff that was authentic, you mm-hmm. might be a believer in this guy, and then you saw this other stuff, and maybe you right. were a little skeptical, right. but mm-hmm. you know, maybe you also trust this guy because it seems like he's telling the truth. And, and like, I understand for a lot of people, it's um, it's a difficult position to be in with something that's hard to believe already. Yeah. Well, so this is the image right here. I put it up on screen for those watching on YouTube and Facebook. Discovering Bigfoot is that. Discovering that's Bigfoot. what it is. Yeah. Finding was the show. I Finding think. was the show. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, right. So now, now, when I saw these images as well, I, I did not, I didn't buy it for a second. Um, and also when you watch the documentary um, or Finding Bigfoot, whichever cover, you know, covered both, um, it, it was super high definition. Oh, yeah. Great. And, and the, the the camera was just holding the frame of this this supposed creature perfectly still. Right. And the creature seems to be looking straight at the camera. So you're saying and then it cuts away. So for what me, happens as, the as a believer, away? you know, what what happened? There was a moment for me that mm-hmm. I was like, oh, they just cut the best part of right. the, the film. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to believe. I, I want, <laughs> you know, I want it to be true. Uh, so there's, you know, in my mind, I'm, I'm jumping hurdles. I'm like, oh, no, there's an explanation for that. You know, it doesn't have to be not true. But there gets to be a point where you're like, oh, is it more likely that it's just not true or that all these things all came in perfect alignment to you know, right. make it true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but do you, so you, do you think that there's more, actually more than one Bigfoot out there? Um, or do you so, think, think that it's just a mythology that has spread? So, so for me, it goes a couple of, like, there's part of me that, that hears the skeptics, you know, that mm-hmm. like, you, you know what they say. They're like, why don't we have, uh, indisputable evidence at this point why isn't somebody hit one with their car mm-hmm. and like you know dragged it out here or something and you know there's people that say oh, people have done that and then it's been covered up and so you know like but the bottom line is that like with with a lot of people e- even now like you saw kind of with the ufo stuff recently that's been getting a little bit more mainstream coverage mm-hmm. that that equals a lot of people changing their mind or changing kind of their attitude for a lot of people. They need that mainstream confirmation, whatever it is. I, a lot of times I call it real science versus mm-hmm. like kind of, you know, plausible science or something. But uh, as soon as it is accepted by mainstream, it just becomes fact, you know, and there's a lot of things that, ha- you know, in, in the film we talked about too, that like, you know, a few hundred years ago, we didn't believe there were certain animals that there have been proven facts. And they're now, you know, common knowledge that those animals exist. And, and that's one of the things I actually learned doing the film was was how common that is now. Mm-hmm. How many legitimately categorized, uh, sci- like, you know, accepted scientifically mainstream science, new species of uh you know, plants a lot, but animals yeah. too. And some of those animals are not 
you know, insects or something microbial or, you know, something you would think, oh, I, I could see what, how that flew under the radar. You know, every now and then it's something relatively large. And, and even in the mainstream, so cryptozoology has a mainstream science accepted, you know, kind of list of animals that are mythological animals mm -hmm. or, or not necessarily mythological, but animals that existed in the past that people think could exist now and have just evaded humanity. However, the, the main one being like, I've, I believe it's the Siberian tiger. And, and a lot of people say that there are sightings, you know, fairly recently. But we do know, I think there have been many reports lately about uh -huh. the potential Tasmanian tiger. Yeah, I, that well. may be the same thing. I'm not, I'm not and, entirely sure. I'm well, that's in, that's in Australia. No, well, the Siberian tiger, I think, um, is it the Siberian leopard? I'm not, I'm not sure. But, but I know for a fact that the t Tasmanian tiger um, would have gone extinct. I think it was in the, the last one filmed alive. I think it was like um, uh, 1909, some, something like that. Um, it was very early when... when yes, it was, like, it was a long time ago. Long time ago, it was it was uh, in captivity, uh -huh. and um, as of late in the past few years, there have been uh, sounds uh, in right in, people have heard that. Um, cryptozoology. Yeah, I misspoke. This think... is what I was talking about. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh -huh. no, no, I, 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 please continue on. You actually seem to have more information about it than I do. <laughs> oh, well, well, no, but now, but now, zoologists are are taking that hunt seriously. Um, oh, absolutely. And the reason they're taking it seriously is not because people are reporting um, some strange sounds, an animal that they saw for a split second. Uh, they're, they're looking into it because we've seen it on film on photographs before, right? So uh -huh. scientists have studied the species in the past. So even though 100 years goes by, um, scientists feel much more comfortable saying, yeah, we'll, we'll look for it because we knew it existed already. Um, but, right. But really what they're basing their search on is people's reports that are no different than the reports coming in from Bigfoot. That's almost my point. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. when you start to hear about that, you realize, mm -hmm. oh, you know, like there there's actually a very serious approach to this whole Bigfoot thing. It doesn't all have to be, you know, Harry and the Henderson. Well, I loved Harry. I love Henderson. Harry and Henderson. Yeah. But uh, a lot of these Bigfoot movies are like scary Bigfoot's going to come and get you in the woods and there right, you know right. horror stories i actually if you have seen any good bigfoot films i would be interested to know because the large majority of the ones i've seen have been uh you know maybe funny at best yeah so, I, I haven't i mean i still think to this day the best film is harry and the hendersons agreed um, you know it was steven spielberg produced so it had that spielbergian um, romanticism but are those are those your cryptids in the background? Oh, you can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're up upstairs. So I have two uh, dogs. I have a basset hound. Okay. And I have a basset and a beagle mix. Well, basset hound's so pretty big. A, yeah, yeah, male and a female. And if any dog walks by the front, uh, mm -hmm. they go upstairs, and he just howls, and they egg each other on. It's well, yeah, uh, it's interesting because. <laughs> In the documentary, there's the discussion of when when Bigfoot comes around, the, the forest goes silent. Um, everything down to the insects. Um, <laughs> now, do you think that would apply to, to your dogs or, or, you know, home pets? So I think that's generally true for us just as human beings, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of you kind of go around the forest and mm -hmm. even like little squirrels or things like that, they don't want to just sit and well, for the most part. You know, they don't want to just sit around and wait to find out what you are. They're more experienced with like, they hear something big mm -hmm. coming in the forest. <laughs> it might be a predator, you know, and it's probably a better idea to avoid that than to take any sort of chances that it might be a friendly, you know, human or a Sasquatch or whatever. Right, right. You know, They're your ears prick up. And mm -hmm. yeah. that's nature. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of learn. I love animals in general. We actually did also a documentary about um, our, we have a special zoo up here because we're such high altitude. There's only two Alpine zoos in the United States. Okay. And so we have one up here and we did a documentary about that. And uh, 
you know, in, in learning about other animals, that's almost super common. Some animals have built in kind of camouflage, like Mm -hmm. being uh, avoiding predators for an animal in the wild. That's something we as human beings have just like completely lost touch with. And for them, it's super common, you know? So a lot of this stuff makes entirely too much sense when you kind of think of it from that perspective. Yeah. And I have to agree that I really don't like that. So many of these films emphasize the the scarier aspect of Sasquatch, but yeah. you don't, you don't ignore that in your film film. It is addressed. Um, there are reports, oh. right. That, that are um, of the, you know, more fearful kind, you know, and I mean, look at us as human beings. We're very vastly different from human to human. There could be some of us that are, you know, wild, you know, crazy people do a lot of <laughs> stuff that you and I would never even think about doing. Or some of us were wild and crazy and, you know, are That's no longer. true too. Yeah. You know, we, we vary a dramatic amount from, right. from person to person. And especially for a lot of these people that think Bigfoot is, you know, human hybrid, it would make mm-hmm. a lot of sense for them to vary, you know, kind of drastically from, you know, their experience to experience. Mm -hmm. And I remember a really interesting story just about primates where um, they essentially took, uh, they took a certain group of primates um, Mm -hmm. away. Uh, I I forget what had happened, but I I believe it had something to do with these alpha primates ate some sort of the wrong food Mm -hmm. and they all died off. All these really aggressive uh, apes in this certain colony of apes kind of died off and it allowed for this entire colony to essentially evolve into like a passive colony oh, of apes. Wow. Interesting. And, and they, you know, were thriving, you know, and uh, it's a very interesting story. Yeah. So and, the, the social dynamic that was undercut mm-hmm. and, and whoever was left behind built a new social structure. Yeah. It would, you know, it showed you kind of this paradigm of, you know, previous to that, you thought part of their culture was to be aggressive and to have this whole thing. Mm-hmm. But that when it kind of was removed just by accident in nature, yeah. you kind of realized, oh, you know, they're they're kind of capable of a lot of what we're capable of, too, is, yeah. you know, kind of a, a passive lifestyle amongst one another. And, uh, you know, you would think that that's kind of common in, in other animals, too. And, and, and what I'll also say about animals, yeah. too, like you encounter a coyote. A lot of coyotes are terrified of us. You know, the initial I'm experience sure. yeah. Yeah. of, you know, encountering a coyote, mm-hmm. you're, they run away. But if you encountered maybe 50 coyotes all at one time, they might be a lot less afraid of you. So it's you know, for animals, a different, different perspective, you know, situationally, it can be, you know, uh, a lot of these Bigfoot might not really be aggressive. Maybe you, you know, came up on them in some sort of way to Mm -hmm. force them to be aggressive. If they're, you know, that's the situation. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because you don't know what their motive is. Um, So like any creature, if you are in the way of their, their motive, um, you don't know how they're going to respond. It's like with people who have pet monkeys, right? Um, and I, I'm sure you remember that story of the woman who her own pet monkey, who she considered a friend, um, attacked um, her friend who knew this monkey for years and, and essentially ate her face off. And yes, when it, it doesn't mean that that monkey is an evil thing. What it means is something triggered its instincts, Right. And it, and it reacted. And the same thing, I suppose, could happen to a Bigfoot. And we, we see it happen to humans. Um, stressful si- situations can cause someone to shut down or can cause some, trigger someone to um, lose their mind and, and become aggressive. There's so many variables. And the power of the subconscious in humans tells us that, you know, we, we, we don't really know all of who we are. You know, I don't know all of who I am. And, you know, it's just there's things that are processing constantly in the back of your mind. Um, and just the right, the perfect storm of things that happen could affect that. Uh, so we have three minutes to the break and I want to get this first comment in. We have more questions, uh, but this is from the KGRA chat room from neutron. 
And it says, is there any data that shows there are never any Bigfoot sightings within a month to and after in areas of reported missing people in national parks, as in the cases of David Paulides? I don't know if you're familiar with David Paulides. Um, trying to find evidence to possibly show that Bigfoot may actually be protecting humans from the cause of the national park disappearances. Does hmm. that make sense? So I, I, we talked a little bit about this. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I have a little bit of information. We kind of touched on it in the film um, that it, it seems like the majority of sightings are kind of in, in a certain area. Mm-hmm. And it almost seems like there's like a, I wouldn't say a trail, but like if Bigfoot were to be, you know, traveling, you know, from say state to state or, or you know, coast to coast or however, however that was theoretically happening, they do seem to be kind of in a, in a certain, you know, pattern. But, um, you know, as far as like, you know, evidence, as far as what this gentleman is looking for, I did mm-hmm. not find that either. So, uh, it's not so easy to find all of the sightings. And, and you also have to remember the large majority of sightings go unreported. Right. So, you know, that, that creates a really difficult um, paradigm for a researcher that's, that's looking for a pattern like what sure, uh, yeah. he is looking for. Right. It's a, it's a deficit of data. Uh-huh. So, so do you think that there um, are patterns out there worth, worth investigating that, that you might consider um, going down that rabbit hole? So, so the ones we presented in the film, I think are legitimate, you know, scientifically kind of based uh, theories you know you, mm-hmm. if you were looking for a big animal there would need to be a water source that's semi nearby you know if you're yeah. in the middle of arizona desert it's probably pretty unlikely that you're gonna stumble upon bigfoot sure. there sure yeah. you know and and that's that's a, a super simplified version mm-hmm. but even in the forest it's there's gonna be you know places where it's it's more likely and, and places where it's less likely right so so you kind of look for that and then you you look for like what we were just talking about you know the the evidence of um numbers is is somewhat of a compelling thing all right well hold it right there jeremy we're gonna have to cut to the break real quick Uh, but we'll come back on the other side and continue our conversation with director jeremy nori and um yeah you know there's a lot to talk about Bigfoot, but there's some questions that we have about, I, I have about other cryptids <laughs> um, and Jeremy's take on all that. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll talk more about that on the other side. Everyone stay tuned. You do not want to miss this tonight. Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now and KGRA. We'll be right back. Stream media's most wanted. KGRARadio.com. Lost in a bad way, cost me my family. Chaos around me, can't hear my heart say. Hey, that's the wrong way. Hey, that's the wrong way. Hey, that's the wrong way. That's the wrong way. Lost in a bad way Starting to let go Gone too far the wrong way Can take it all back now Lost in a bad way Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith, your most grateful host. And I am with Jeremy Nori of Sky Island Storytelling. If you want to find out more about Jerry, Jeremy, go to at Sky Island Storytelling on Twitter. And yes, once again this week, I allowed Bill to just flicker in for a second. <laughs> that was my fault, everyone. But Bill, it's always good to see you on the air anyway. So welcome back. If you haven't been listening, uh, this has been a really exciting conversation that I've, that I've had with Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, you're, you're just such a nice person to chat with. Um, super relaxed. And, uh, somebody asked, um, did he smoke before he came on tonight? Uh Oh yeah, it's true. <laughs> well, that's a compliment. 
That's an absolute compliment. And, <laughs> I mean, you, and you do believe that there um, are medical benefits that marijuana and cannabis does, does have that um, it's been a detriment to so many people that it's been a difficult to access that, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, so I, I talked a little bit about it. Like my experience is very deep in, in the cannabis industry and kind of when you were first getting into it, um, a lot of the original legislation and, and, you know, all the, the legality that we were getting uh, any sort of momentum on was medical cannabis. And, uh, you know, as you went out to any of those events or organized uh, gatherings of any kind, you would kind of, um, at, at very least, encounter some authentic, really authentic patients that, you know, it, was, it wasn't like what it is for, for the large majority of people. You know, some people say all cannabis use is uh, medical for whatever reason, if it's, you know, stress relief or, or just uh, even what theoretically is entertainment, you know, that's, you know, some sort of a distraction or, or, uh, you know, et cetera. But for, for other people, it is almost like life or death. They can exist with it, you know, in a, a, a livable way, mm -hmm. but without it, it's almost, um, you know, completely debilitating to them. Well, and you, you seem like an objective person. So from, mm -hmm. from an objective standpoint, do you think that, the, with the pros and cons, whatever they might be for the marijuana experiment in the states that have legalized it. Um, is it, is it still worth it? Uh, are, are there cons that outweigh it? So, um, you know, to me, I think it, it's worth it. Um, for, for, for all these places, it's a money thing, right? Mm -hmm. So are they getting more money than they are theoretically losing? And, um, you know, that's an like that's such an astronomical number, the way that that works out, you know, like you're, you know, let's say you're on the opposition, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're facing two op opposing forces that are working against you uh, money wise. You're you're you're, you know, now dealing with a rep of something that's getting revenue for the state, whereas they had zero dollars were coming in prior to any sort of like sure. legalized medical or legalized mm -hmm. recreational zero dollars are theoretically coming into the state their entire revenue source is from the illegality right it's from uh you know fines related to it you know maybe maybe they get like a little revenue from the legal growing things that people are buying and they're getting a little tax money from that but almost nothing they're getting so, so when you, you change the laws, now they're getting this huge revenue source from taxing it. And the taxes aren't like tiny. They're fairly decent sized taxes, some of these places. Mm -hmm. So you're getting this like large revenue source. And then like, so, so prior to this, not only were they not making money on it, they were spending money on this illegality. On the prevention. Uh, part of it yeah because mm -hmm. now you're you're employing cops to spend their time giving people tickets for the cannabis and theoretically the amount of time that this policeman spends versus the fines that they're writing are you know somehow profitable for the state mm -hmm. it's it's like it's this uh it, it just became like a, a ridiculous situation and, and mm -hmm. you know for them it was still worth it in some ways right because they want to be able to to take a look at certain people and you know saying oh you smell marijuana in your car is you know a reason but that i don't think has really gone away for them you know the the way that it works uh is you know you're not supposed to be smoking in your car right so if they walk up to your car a lot of times they could probably still get away with a, a lot of people be intimidated you right. just say, you know, oh, I smell pot and they can do whatever they want. Now, is there any evidence for cryptids like like Bigfoot using herbs and natural? So, um... so I have some stories. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, being that I, I am uh, in that industry, I've been up to Humble a number of times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as just an enthusiast in Bigfoot, the first time that I ever saw 
uh, that forest, the basically the forest of that Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And you get you get a couple of views there on that drive where you know you really see the span of it, and you see how dense it is and how far it spans, and you kind of get a moment to yourself where you're like, "Oof, anything could be out there." Like, I, it, it's a kind of a humbling moment when you realize the vastness of like the trees are already enormous. Yeah. Right. And so then you're seeing like basically trees like this, as far as you could see. Sure. And, uh, you, you, you realize, Oh, anything could kind of be out there. No, and yeah. Anyone, and, who, anyone who's done hiking understands that. So, so in marijuana, a lot of people kind of delve deep into the forest to do that sort of mm -hmm. profession. So I have, uh, I used to write for a magazine and uh, one of my jobs for that magazine was kind of going to different places that they wanted to do articles on. And one of my friends uh, kind of took me out to some gardens in uh, uh, Humboldt, Southern Humboldt. And uh, we had dinner at one of the houses that night. And, you know, I, I at one point during the dinner, I, I remembered, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen them up here on one of those Bigfoot shows. So I said to them, I said, hey, doesn't Bigfoot live up here? And they immediately just gave me all this Bigfoot stories. And yeah. the stories were wild. Some of the stories were, were that friends of theirs literally thought that Bigfoot stole their weed. Like came into their garden and like took sounds, their plan. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a little bit like, you know, high paranoia, but hey, I, I guess I think possible. Look, I mean, look, if you're if we're speculating about Bigfoot being interdimensional, I think we could we can entertain maybe they like uh, someone's particular plants. Exactly. You yeah. know, I didn't I didn't just completely dismiss it, but it was a funny story. And, you know? I mean, did they have the evidence for that or were they just uh, you know, they had their anecdotal evidence about how they had seen Bigfoot with their plants and that then their plants were gone. And the only explanation was that Bigfoot had clearly stolen their plants. Well, yeah, but so. I think because <laughs> these, these animals um, would be very intelligent, perhaps not at the level of humans, but, but, but close. And um, cats like catnip. Right. Oh, the, the yeah. animals throughout nature do have their own little fixes. And um, let me tell you, mm -hmm. like um, in the growing of cannabis, you know, you could use some sort of growing materials that might attract animals. One of my friends put fish emulsion into their plants that they were growing outdoors and they attracted bears. They put, oh, so, they put what in it? Fish emulsion. Okay. It's like a, a fishy smelling product, sure. you know, so the bears smelled it. They have good sense of smell, and mm -hmm. this is like a smelly thing that that is on these plants, and you're putting it on there, you know, not just once, you know. And uh, eventually, bears came and destroyed their plants, you know. Wow. Yeah. So before we get into the more metaphysical side of this, mm -hmm. have people noted – a societal structure. Um, and I know people, I hear people say that there are family units and that sort of thing, but it, what evidence is there really for that other than someone just making a speculation up? So I have not personally seen the evidence, but mm -hmm. um, like in Humboldt, one of the stories that was compelling to me was some sort of lady that they all knew and she had pictures of Bigfoot that would come to her house mm -hmm. and that it was a family that there were little ones and they all acted like this was a true story, you know? So like, and they had all allegedly seen these photos. So it was, it's one of those moments where like a lot of times you're dealing with situations where people believe the story that they're telling you, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not a true story. Um, somehow they are, you know, misled or just there's, you know, some, and some sort of misunderstanding where like they're just not picking up on it or whatever reason they believe this to be true, but it, it's not factually true. And uh, it's very difficult to decipher that. 
when uh you know you're dealing with uh, i mean even if you've seen the subject matter yourself sometimes it's just super just it's very very difficult to well know. how many reports are there of seeing more than one bigfoot in at, at once in one area you know it's more common than you think the the one of the things that i uh you know agree with the skeptics on mm-hmm. with bigfoot sorry um this uh the the concept that um bigfoot is uh uh there, there's there should be more videos of bigfoot or, or sasquatch or any of these creatures right sure yeah. that a lot of the more compelling video is still the patterson gilman footage and uh like shouldn't there be more and and one of the ones that i thought was semi interesting was this family of bigfoot that's like by a river and uh that's like one of the more popular ones it's also allegedly been debunked so uh but to me that was one of the more uh compelling ones And, and it was some sort of a family looking structure uh how common is it? You're right. You know, the large majority of them are single Bigfoot sightings Mm -hmm. and, you know, probably the large majority of those sightings are not authentic. Right. For whatever reason. Do you, do you think that there is, um, have you, have you focused in on an area where you're sure that there is a a Bigfoot living there? Like other, is there one or two particular areas where you think if you're going to go there, um, the odds are much higher to, to witness a Bigfoot. So that goes back as to what I was saying before. The the other researcher was saying that, you know, if you just kind of look at where most of the sightings happen, that's the most compelling thing I've seen so mm-hmm. far. Um, I've talked to some people who say that they've routinely seen uh, Bigfoot or, you know, some sort of like a Sasquatch creature. They also thought maybe it was like Dogman um yeah so uh I, well, but I, mean, I personally have not gone to those locations I yes would like to in the future but one would think that you'd be able to tell the difference easily between a dog man and a bigfoot right i would think so so dog man is less believable to me than bigfoot bigfoot f- yeah. for me a lot of the Bigfoot stuff that I find most interesting is the older stuff, like uh, all the different Indian names or, mm-hmm. or, or Native American names of uh, Sasquatch type creatures, right? And there's yeah. all these various different ones and they didn't meet each other or speak the same languages. And there's there's a lot of, of evidence, you know, details to those stories that lead it towards being true. Um, and then, you know, the older... Uh, fossil record evidence that we have on like that there were potentially these other you know kind of ape-like creatures that um you know i guess the the one that's universally accepted is the uh blackie uh uh australopithecus right so like or or humble florensiensis which is the the opposite end of the spectrum it's a very tiny aka the hobbit yeah, that that has its merit too. Where you mm-hmm. know we're not mistaking that for for Sasquatch, but right. mm-hmm. the f- existence of that is compelling. It leads towards the potential existence of a, a large version of this, essentially the same creature, right? right? And that was only up until I think their their best estimates. Um, this this uh, species lived until ten thousand years ago, maybe a little less. It was fairly recent to where Which like. Really- if you were going through ancient history, mm-hmm. there's probably a few stories that and uh, that are authentic of people that actually did see these things. Yeah, but who knows? You know, it's also maybe not. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's lore. Or, I mean, we all. How many people believe a werewolf actually exists? Right? It's been reported for a long time. Um, yeah, yeah. But the idea that a man or anyone can transform into a werewolf or into any other kind of creature, uh, you know, it's not believable. So I guess, I guess um, with the advent of science, we just took our, um, (laughs) our paranormal speculatives and, and turned it into a dog man. We're saying, (laughs) well, it doesn't transfer from a human into, 
you know, a wolf. Right. But it's a dog man. It's just always the dog man. That's that's that. Everyone was confused. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know, lore. I love that. I love local myth. I think it's it's fascinating. I think it's healthy in a way, actually. Oh, I totally love werewolves. I love all of that. You know, part of me figures like law of averages eventually one of these things that i like (laughs) is gonna be true (laughs) one day we're going to see a unicorn (laughs) you know like is it dragons is it gonna be you know what's gonna be the one (laughs) um i have a question from Susie in the chat from facebook she says do you think there are different types or strange strains um of of sasquatch i guess like humans we have different races right um, yeah, yeah. So the strain thing is kind of a cannabis reference. Mm-hmm. There's different kinds of cannabis. They're, they're, you know, if, if you just go by the reports, there's obviously different kinds. Mm-hmm. You know, the the Sasquatch that you hear about, um, I forget where it is, but there's one that's like red, theoretically, right? Okay. And he's got kind of like an orangutan or, or like, you know, my hair is kind of red. And uh, that seems different than some of the other ones that are like maybe gray and and then there seems to be size difference where uh some of the ones that they're reporting are are significantly smaller than the ones that we see over in uh the northwest okay and uh and then also in other countries you know the yeti is you know fairly different there's a chinese uh version there's a russian version like there's there's all these different um there's there's many different stories right and are the behaviors between these different reported uh entities are they similar or do they change based on their environment but there are still other crossover behaviors so it seems so it seems like the majority of certain places have you know, similarities of, of how those, and, you know, who knows how, maybe that's the nature of storytelling Mm -hmm. where, you know, maybe you heard a story and you tell a similar story. Um, But theoretically, if these are authentic, it also, you know, would lead towards that. Uh, Some of the stories, there's certain ones that are, you know, vastly different stories than the large majority, Mm -hmm. but they do differ. There, I forget where it is. There's a certain area where the Sasquatch seems extremely aggressive, right? You know, and then there's other that seem fairly benevolent, so to speak, where you know maybe they're more scared of us than than uh, violent, so to speak. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's uh, there's also a circumstance if if we're dealing with all these as authentic situations, it's going to be circumstantial. You know, you you run up on a Sasquatch and you've got a gun or something and maybe a dog, he might be really intimidated. Yeah. But, you know, if you're like a seven-year-old child and you walk up on Sasquatch, you might be a lot less intimidated. So uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I remember when I was, when I was really little, I, I, you know, I saw um, Follow That Bird, um, okay. the Muppets movie. And uh, so I did that with like a little stick and I put some, some little uh, trinkets of toothbrush or whatever and tied it in a bandana at the end of a stick. And I was going to go on this trip um, in the woods and I didn't make it very far. And then there was some other, other kid that was you know only a little bit bigger and was a bully. And that was the end of my trip. Um, <laughs> so all I know is if that same me came across a giant Bigfoot, would it be a Harry and Henderson's moment would I? Would there be that sort of like <laughs> un, unstated, intuitive sense that this is a, a benevolent creature, or would you know, like we said earlier, would my instincts just go, "I don't know what that is. I'm out of here." Yeah, that's that's the likely situation. I uh, mean, so, for anyone who's just tuning in, we are talking to Jeremy Nori, and uh, yeah, we're covering all things cryptid and uh, alien, earthly alien as well. So we're going to open up the KGRA lines in just about 10 minutes. So we'll give you the cue when those open to call in the number to ask Jeremy your questions. It's 85-KGRA-LIVE. It's 855-472-5483 for the Paranormal Radio app hotline. Um, Okay, so uh, on your list of cryptids, Uh what would be the, the top three that you think 
um, may or do exist? So, so uh, Sasquatch is, is one of the ones, you know, mm -hmm. I have heard a lot. Uh, it's one of those numbers games too. It's got the largest number of reports. And even though probably the large majority of those, there's, you know, issues with one way or another, mm -hmm. misunderstandings, complete hoaxes, you know, everything that you can imagine. Um, but just the this, this sheer scale of those also leads towards some of those are going to be authentic sightings, you know, and, or, you know, the closest thing to authentic if you know, it, it ends up not being authentic, but right. I have uh, a question. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Go right ahead. We have a question from the chat room from Neutron and mm -hmm. it's, have you ever watched the progressively developed communication videos of Bigfoot on the Ontario Sasquatch YouTube channel? So I don't believe I've seen that. I've seen some, I, if he's talking about what I'm taught, what I'm thinking, it's like, um, there seems to be a lot of audio of Bigfoot mm -hmm. talking to one another. Yeah. And it's like some, it's really odd chatter. And I saw something where some sort of professional in, in like linguistics or some sort of language professional yeah. kind of reviewed it and it had, you know, some sort of authenticity. To the Is that story. what you were, you were, were discussing um, in your film, is that the same? so? Matt mentioned it also. I believe he's seen, you know, either the same or similar thing to what I've seen. Okay, and do you do you think that's believable, or is the analysis uh, legit? If you've ever heard it, it's hard to believe that that's real. You know, it sounds like nonsense, but you know, you listen to the experts talk, and theoretically, he's smarter than I am. And he has this argument to how it's real. So for me, I sit kind of on the, the side of the fence where I don't really believe it, mm -hmm. but I, I leave the door open. You know, maybe I'm misguided on that somehow. And it is true. Well, of all the audio howls or sounds that you've heard that are reported to be Bigfoot, do you think any of those are authentic that, that they've caught something that is not a bobcat that is not a someone's pet bird a parakeet that you know was let loose in the woods the sounds that i think are the most authentic sound are are more of an animal kind of sound you know that's why i lean kind of towards maybe one of these is a primate you know but um well there is a there, there is a call and response to some of these recordings right so yes, yeah, some of the sounds that I've heard are, you know, it seems like there's evidence to where it's not humanly possible that a, mm -hmm. that a human made this sound. And that, that would be what you're hearing, right? You, you think, okay, if I'm debunking it, you know, I, I make some sort of sound, maybe even some sort of humans that I don't know are out doing the same thing that I'm doing. Sure. And they're yelling back at me. And both of us think we're hearing Bigfoot, but it's not it's both of us being idiots, you know? Um, <laughs> and I'm sure that happens yeah, now yeah. and then. <laughs> well, <laughs> but there are a lot of reports of people having stones or, or things thrown at them. That's true. Um, now, granted, if you're in the woods, things fall from the trees, right? But, but these reports seem to be very directed um, assaults almost uh, c coming Some from, of them not seem from very above, awesome. but from, you know, more lateral. Yeah. I've heard very similar stories mm -hmm. and, and some of those stories seem true where, you know, maybe the rock was like something that was very difficult to lift, let alone throw as far as it theoretically flew. You know, there's little bits of evidence towards some of these stories and make them a little more true or a little mm -hmm. like less. It's, it's not even true or not true. It's, it's easy to believe, you know, yeah. some of them seem believable right away. And some of them, it takes a minute to kind of think, yeah. hey, is this true? Well, people report, Oh, you, you can look for nests in the woods, um, right? Branches, broken branches. Yep. How does one discern what is just nature um, happening on its own and some intelligent, you know, species <laughs> doing this. 
you know, I guess theoretically, you know, what if you found a nest and in that nest you found some hair or some sort of DNA mm-hmm. that could be used to authenticate this as proof? Mm-hmm. I think that would be your best case scenario with finding something like a nest. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to prove that this was not made by humans yeah. or this was not made by some other animal. You know, animals are capable of things that you wouldn't – you'd be surprised by. And, you know, a lot of these things seem impossible. There's that too. You know, there's no explanation. And so the explanation becomes some sort of a theoretical explanation. And, and it's hard to prove any of those things. So. so if we're looking for nests, then we think that this is um, a natural evolved, earthly evolved species, probably a primate. But if we yeah. think that it's metaphysical, if it's something that is stepping between worlds, does that make sense? So I think you've definitely hit on one of the things I experienced is there seems to be conflicting theories Mm -hmm. in the Bigfoot Bigfoot culture or crypto culture in general, right? Um, There's just subcultures about this this kind of stuff. (laughs) It's just that as something gets bigger, that's the nature of the beast, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, you're right. Like some, some people believe it to be something that can like, travel in between dimensions which is hard for me to believe but you know there's some people have these stories too where like they believe that to be true and you listen to them tell the story and it's hard to to you know not feel that way you know their 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 emotion is compelling but yeah absolutely why would you need the nest if you can travel to another dimension right that's the that's the question mark. Well, maybe there could be nests <laughs> in the other dimension too. I guess there could be, right? But wouldn't yeah. you know, like, I I don't know. I guess maybe there's not like a dimension with really nice nests where you can travel to, or you know yeah. something. Uh, Graham Hancock <laughs> had written um, a book, a novel, and uh, the the theory behind this was that Neanderthals. Um, were psychic now he's just you know making this up you know for for fictional purposes but um but the, but that idea that you know that maybe uh there are things that the human mind has forgotten or there are abilities that we are incapable of and that you know because we always think in terms of the science mind so to do something like transverse dimensions would mean you have to be a super sophisticated advanced technological um, society, but maybe right. we're wrong. Maybe um, there are creatures out there um, on other planets here on Earth that have the ability to to cross over, and it's actually perfectly natural. We just don't know how to do it. So, absolutely, like if it were a true thing, then there would be some sort of physical capability that's beyond us. You know, like. I mean, we can't change our skin color, but all of us, I think, have seen videos of, uh, you know, squid or whatever uh, changing color on like, you know, in a snap. And it's like unbelievable texture. You're you're like, this is alien. This is unbelievable to me. (laughs) You know, that's true. So, you know, anything's possible. But I also believe the opposite side of this story, too. So, like you know if if if, uh, if if you're talking about something like uh uh sasquatch in nature being able to uh you know transverse dimensions and whatnot sure. you, you know like you're really opening the door for for a lot of kind of you know unproven science shall we say so but well is there evidence then for that right because if you're if you're strictly a naturalist then you look for the nests you look for broken branches and certain patterns right uh that would that would imply intelligence but if you're suspecting that this thing is coming from other dimensions then what do you look for how how could you possibly support that i find that one of the hardest theories to believe and so I don't have a lot of great evidence 
towards why it's true. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a lot of, of, you know, seemingly reasonable reasons why it's probably not true. Mm-hmm. It seems probably pretty obvious for, for the large majority. So, you know, it's, it's, you're very right with what you're saying, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, essentially what you would have to start trying to do is, is triangulate if any of these like disappearances or reappearances are happening in like the same area. Mm-hmm. And then theoretically you would want to capture one either like on camera or see it, you know, at least with your eyes right? Yeah. or, you know, like. Uh, but there, there are people who have said that they have seen a, a Sasquatch, a Bigfoot, whatever you know, materialize in front of their eyes and, and, or disappear in front of their eyes. So there are eyewitness accounts, but again, we just don't have, like you said, anything on film. Absolutely. How much longer do we have? Just curious. Oh yeah. We've got uh, 28 minutes and good cue. The lines <laughs> are now officially open. So if you want to call in and ask Jeremy your questions, aliens, Bigfoots, cryptids, um marijuana legalization call on in 85 kgra <laughs> live that's 85 kgra live for the paranormal radio app hotline or 855-472-5483 which leads me jeremy to is there a connection between extraterrestrial visitation or re- ufo reports and and bigfoot there's a little crossover there, you know, um, that's kind of the nature of, of the subject. Right. So mm-hmm. some people kind of think that that Bigfoot might be similar to, to us, uh, right. Where they think we're some sort of an alien human hybrid. Mm-hmm. The Bigfoot might be also some sort of maybe an alien primate hybrid or, or maybe an alien human and primate hybrid or, or something of the variation there. Right. So, Um, and they think maybe like, I've also heard stories where like Bigfoot is like kind of working as, as like the man on the street for the UFO, uh, situation where they beam down this like animal that's like, you know, durable (laughs) and able to kind of go around and and not be hurt and, and is, you know, incognito and it gathers information somehow. That's the, interesting, uh, like a like a covert yeah uh, <laughs> um, scout you know i guess like yeah. in reality we all are kind of these like meat meccas right we got like yeah you know the inside of us is this brain and a bunch of like little you know senses nerves endings and whatnot but like mm-hmm. the rest of us is the skeleton and meat and you know theoretically i guess what if you could kind of transport that you know between into another thing so like some alien can kind of go down and he's this big bigfoot or something like that mm-hmm. right you know it's a cool story i don't know if i believe it but you well, know i guess that would explain then if you um if you are trying to like we were trying to figure out well why would they have a nest well maybe you know if you have if you're sending down a species that already can live like that comfortably it's it's the you don't want to build a fort right so right. the best way to stay incognito is to blend in with the forest. And yeah, yeah. you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah, like it's like a soldier that you drop off in a foreign country and, they and camouflage and you know, right. live in the forest for a little while. And then you pick them up at the end. And yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got all your in- intelligence. You've got your information. It's not a wild, you know, when you talk about it like that, it sounds like, Oh, that's of course, that's what it is. You know? So like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so if you were to do a follow-up film on Bigfoot, what would you... So we have one in the works, but we are also looking for some sort of a subject matter. But we're we're thinking about doing an uh, Mm experience-based film where we do go kind of and we get a little bit more detail about actual sightings, maybe maybe we don't actually have a sighting and we talked about looking and like going somewhere where there was a sighting or something like that, but just kind of like playing off of like the experience thing. The one we've got that's almost done is the compare and contrast between the two cultures of, of UFO versus Bigfoot, because uh, we actually didn't realize there's actually, there's certain things that they have in common, 
but they can be also very different. So it's, um, it's interesting to, to kind of meet these people that are very, you know, passionate about one or the other. Right. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, you have our, our first caller, Malcolm from Florida. Malcolm, welcome to Paranormal Now. You are on the air. Hi there. <clears throat> Calling from Port Charlotte, Florida. Malcolm, Malcolm can you hear us? Where we have uh, evening thunderstorms all the uh, time. Looks like we it have lost Malcolm. We have him connected. Uh, sorry, Malcolm, Excuse we me? can't hear you. Maybe your uh, phone is on mute. All uh, right. We'll, we'll hang in there for a moment and see if um, Bill can get Malcolm back on the line and hook him up. Um, yeah. So anyone who else wants to call in, the number is 85 KGRA live. It's 855-472-5483. I, I have always adored the idea of Bigfoot. Do you, do you really think that those reports that are of the more violent ilk um, is accurate is that 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 bigfoot is indeed um an aggressive species because yeah maybe it plucks some chickens but i i don't know so you know i i kind of look at it as like a lot of animals are aggressive in the wild the wild is a very difficult place to survive that i don't think like bigfoot is malicious where they're just you know like a like a they enjoy doing violent things to people for no reason. I just look at it as if there are violent situations that happen, that there's some sort of natural kind of selection um, aspect to it. They're, mm -hmm. you know, caught in the wrong kind of situation. They're very maybe hungry or, or, or something. And, and, you know, um, mental problems are hard for humans that are considered very intelligent something that lives in the forest are there mental problems there might be certain ones that just have some sort of mental problem and they like act out you know in, in some like sort a, of crazy way sure like a genetic kind of a, a kind of a situation right yeah you know like anything's possible like that and uh you know i like i said i just don't think it's like some sort of like you know, really malicious situation where they just enjoy doing violence because sure. they think it's funny or something. And, and you know, that might be a, like an adolescent type of thing. If, if that is true at all in any sort of way, maybe mm -hmm. like a very young kind of Bigfoot kind of learns that growing up yep. that, you know, that's a human learning experience too. Yeah. The parallels that are there. All right. I think we've got so, uh, Malcolm back on the air. Malcolm, how are you? Hi, I am uh, still alive, as a matter of fact. Not, hey, hey, uh, that's good. From, <laughs> yeah, not coming to you from beyond the grave tonight. Very good, um, very good. Listen, I, I, yeah, I'm listening to the show with uh, great interest. I'm wondering if your guest ever knew a, uh, uh, a cryptid hunter named Jan Beckyard from the Seattle area? I've heard the name, but I never knew them. Ah, well, he was a real person, and he used to come into my Photoshop with negatives. I specialized in making big enlargements, you see, two by three feet. And he'd say, I want you to blow this quarter-inch uh, area up to two by three feet, and let's, let's see what's going on there. So Where I'd was this? And he'd say, huh? Where did you say Seattle. this was? Okay, Seattle. Yeah, I've, been out, I've spent some time in Seattle. It, it's mm -hmm. a city in Washington State. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Okay. Anyway, he'd he'd point to like a smiley face in the photo grain, and he'd say, "You see, it's spirits that's making that making the faces. You know, there's something there." And they'd say, "You know, Jan, it's pareidolia. You know, you're seeing you're programmed to see faces. The grain pattern is random." That's and true. He said, no, no. Yeah. Well, different interpretations. Anyway, <laughs> the subject I really the subject I really want to ask about is the cryptids and all this, uh, even UFOs. People are so focused on things outside of us. We have creatures living right here beside us on this planet that are quite superior to us in brain power, at least, you know, from physical description. And I believe have hidden resources that we don't 
really understand, but which we are going to need very desperately in the future. And I'm talking about the dolphins, basically, the toothed whales. Absolutely. Has, yeah. anybody, since... has anybody since John Lilly been seriously looking at these things? I mean, I talked with a group of scientists this afternoon that were holding a, uh, an ask a question thing, you know. Um, and I think they all took it kind of strange when I asked if any of them were investigating human dolphin telepathy. But I and several other people who have written books about it have experienced that. And so that's an interesting topic. Um, yeah, I think I think there that um, there there isn't a lot of legitimate science that's been done on that up to this point. But I yeah. think that. That kind of a concept, like, you know, what one of the things you're talking about, a lot of mainstream science obviously does accept, is that animals have a lot of abilities sense-wise that we do not have, especially, um, why, you know, why, water animals. Why? Why? Yeah, other animals. We're animals. Yeah. Please. And, and theoretically, Don't refer to them that way. you know would that be something that's possible for us as humans? Did we lose it uh, somehow down the line? Uh, is it something we could figure out how to gain? Uh, anything's possible, right? I think that um, yeah. those kind of science uh, studies are going to have to be done. They're either going on right now, and I, I maybe don't know uh, about all of them, you know, or... They, they are, are as far as I can tell. I mean, maybe future. China's got more dolphins pinned up than anybody else right now. Maybe somewhere there, over there, there, there could be anything going mm-hmm. on in some of those other countries. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else, Malcolm? Well, I just thought I just thought I'd raise the point because nobody else is. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I appreciate your input because um, I care just as much as as you do. I had a friend of mine who. Okay. My my website. Very quickly. Sure. Go ahead, Malcolm. Okay. Uh, it's malcolmbrenner.com. Spelt with uh, M-A-L-C-O-L-M-B-R-E-N-N-E-R.com. All right. Very good, Malcolm. Thank you so much, and have a good night. You too. All right. So, yeah, I, I had a friend who had a, a very intimate experience um, with with a dolphin chasing off a shark. Um, and, and these stories wow. happen a lot. Um there, there is a connection there between dolphin and humans that I don't think we, we understand. And, and when you hear about these reports, um, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, uh, haven't you heard of reports where there is a sort of interaction between the person and, and this entity? There, yeah, some of, those, some of the best stories are, are um you know, essentially interaction stories. And, and I, I love the benevolent Bigfoot stories where they encounter, you know, like a, like a little girl or something Mm -hmm. and they're coming into their yard and somehow they've become like almost like friends. And, uh, you know, those are, those are like heartwarming stories. Um, I want them to be true. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough thing. Um, and, and like with aliens, it's like, the large majority of those stories are semi scary, uh, you know, and and uh, I, I understand that too. Um, the the ones that are like uh, friendly stories are harder to believe, but but you know, even even some of the ones that that are you know some semi science or or uh, you know documentable, where they seem to have like turned off nuclear missiles or, or something like that, that they've done some sort of, you know, seemingly verifiable action that, that looks also like a very peaceful gesture kind of thing. Sure. Those, those are pretty reassuring, you know, wouldn't that be great that, you know, I'd, I'd feel a lot better knowing that and anything bad were to, to maybe happen and we got them, you know, watching over us too. Yeah. So I have a private message. Uh, the question is, how many sightings a year um, are reported in North America? Oh, geez. That, so that's a Google one. It, it, there's more than you think. There are thousands and thousands of sightings. Okay. And it's, it's you know, like most of them are not true, unfortunately. That's the worst part about it is that people think it's funny. 
to report them. People have, you know, misunderstandings. There's a lot of bears. There's a lot of different sure. things mm-hmm. that people get scared and see, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, and then, you know, you mix into that, like a certain percentage of them are, you know, very seemingly authentic. And even then, like maybe there, there's still some sort of like, um, misunderstanding there somehow. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really hard. I'm every trail cam image I've ever seen that is purported to be a, a Bigfoot or suspected to be one. Um, it always looks like a bear to me. I, I just, I've never seen anything that is, that is convincing. You know, there's part of me that wants to believe some of them, right. Mm-hmm. You know, I look at it and I'm looking at the arms and I'm thinking, yeah, maybe there's some truth to that. You couldn't make a suit that did that. Maybe that is real. And then there's part of me that kind of sees what, what you're seeing on a, a lot more of them yeah. where it seems like somebody maybe faking it on purpose or just something that is like a glitch, like being in film, you, you realize how, uh, how untrustworthy film, uh, is. And especially digital, it, it's, it's, you know, glitchy. Sometimes weird things happen, mm-hmm. light shifts this way or that way, like all kinds of weird stuff happens. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, well, even recently in, in Brazil, the reports of this UFO crash, um, and people were going to to Google Maps, and um, in Maje, they're saying that there is this UFO, and you can see it on the Google Maps image. And it's like, well, first of all, that image was not taken last night. <laughs> and right. The odds of it actually being taken last night, um, and and the image was was supposedly of a UFO, but it really just looked like it was either a glitch or a glare, you know, just like a, mm-hmm. and it created this sort of white, um, almost UFO shape, um, right next to a house or something like that, and. Um, yeah, yeah, we just have to accept that as much as we want things to be true, it doesn't mean that they they are. Um, I have a question from chat. I'm going to share this, even though we have touched on this. And this is from Albert. It said, um, is Bigfoot an ET species? You know, I don't have definitive proof. And everything that I have seen personally leads me to think that that's not true. You know, but right. wouldn't that be cool? Uh, there's a part of me that wants that to be the thing, right? <laughs> um, and I have I have a comment here from Mike Heston Rogers, who was, uh, hey, Mike, how are you? A friend of Travis Walton. He was there driving the truck. He was a witness, and he's also a host on KGRA Radio as well. And oh, Mike awesome. says, once when I was walking to an old Indian man in Northern California, he said we got the name turned around. He said it isn't really called Sasquatch said they call them big, scary things hanging around their village, squawk <laughs> match. So that's an interesting piece of information. Thanks, Mike. Hey, you know, I love all that stuff. And I, I, I also uh, am looking to do as many podcasts about any of our subject matters as possible. So if uh, he's looking for guests, I'm looking <laughs> for podcasts. There you go. <laughs> Mike has some uh, oh, one on thing. TV, one right. thing I did want to mention. Uh, sure. Sorry. Uh, so you you were talking about kind of um, uh, human capabilities that maybe uh, we've lost. I am into a subject called mentalism. And uh, interesting. Do you know what that is? I, I do. Yeah. So when you see some of the best people that do mentalism you start to realize, oh, you know, like we've, I feel like we've definitely lost some of this like simple knowledge of like just how physically suggestive we are as people. And like some of that stuff, it seems like magic. You're like, oh, these are real sorcerers. Like they've made a deal with the devil. How could you know these things? Yeah. I I, I was with (laughs) an event where someone, uh, uh, was um, at, at a piano with a mentalist. This was part of a show. The, mm-hmm. the mentalist sat at the piano. This person put their hand on their shoulder. Um, and the mentalist was supposed to kind of intuit the song that this person had in their head. However, the mentalist did say it should be a Elvis song, right? Mm-hmm. Or Elvis or Beatles, one or the other. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was Beatles. He wanted to do a Beatles song. He said, so think of a Beatles song and I'll play it. Well, this person... 
for whatever reason, thought of an Elvis song. And so he's sitting there, right? And you could see him struggling. And he was like, kind of like, huh. It couldn't, he couldn't figure it out. And then finally he started playing Blue Suede Shoes. And that was the song. And it's, you know, so this person <laughs> kind of threw him for a loop. And he still was able to figure out the song that they were thinking just by putting their hands on his shoulder. And I'm thinking, I don't. I'm sure those I'm people not, are tapped into it, something a, that you and amazing. I are not tapped into. It is amazing. Yes. Um, so I have another yeah. uh, comment here by Albert in chat on YouTube. Uh, he says there are compelling video clips from that Brazil, Brazil crash. Um, you just have to sort through them out from a lot of fake and unrelated clips um, interspersed. And I and I agree with him. Um, the, you probably had to deal with that too as you're investigating your "I Want to Believe" documentary and this documentary yeah. as well. Uh, I looked at the Brazil crash recently and like, I felt like, uh, that what he just said leads me to where my position is. I I'm on the fence. I don't know if it was real or not. Mm-hmm. I saw a couple things right at the beginning that seemed real to me, you know? And, uh, I, I don't keep track of a lot of the stuff, you know, yeah. I just kind of saw it. And, and then like now I, I, uh, I've seen a lot of other stuff that seems to lead, lead, towards maybe this isn't true um that's kind of how i approach a lot of these things you know time is one of the factors with with a lot of this stuff and you know you see something happen and it could be anything and uh you kind of got to give it a little time to see what the story is what's the narrative that they're going with and that's where i usually go kind of back and forth you know if i hear a narrative that seems unbelievable you know, that leads me towards kind of believing that it might be something more to this. And, you know, every now and then, kind of more often, there's some sort of narrative where you're like, ah, that seems kind of possible. That's right. more plausible than, you know. Well, we'll have to have you on there's... again. We'll have to have you on again to discuss I Want to Believe documentary and, and your other uh, upcoming work as well. But do you, mm-hmm. love do it. you believe in extraterrestrials do you do you think that earth is being visited by off-planet aliens oh you know there's i i i somehow do you know like some of these stories especially the historical stories they Mm -hmm. just do it for me you know i hear these stories and there's there's part of me that like i've just had so many experiences that were misunderstandings that um you kind of you kind of get a feel for what's a true story and what's, what's not. Mm -hmm. And. Oh, we just lost Jeremy. Wow. The timing here is utterly unfortunate because we're just about to wrap up. So I'm going to have to wrap up for Jeremy for him, unless he pops in in the next minute. Um, so if you'd like to find out more about his films, you can go to Amazon. They are free for Amazon prime members. And the, the film that we have been discussing tonight, don't call me Bigfoot. I really thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I also mostly got through, I want to believe, which I will continue later on. And of course he has his, uh, cannabis films and more coming up as well. Thank you all very much for joining in tonight. I appreciate your support. I appreciate the comments and the questions. And I hope that you are all healthy, well, and safe throughout this night. And in the coming days, you know, KGRA, we're like a, we're like a little family here. Um, Mike Rogers popped in and you can find out more about his show, The Realist on KGRA, Carol Carl behind the Obsidian Curtain, and so many other fantastic shows. And all of those people that I get to communicate with Bill Skywatcher, our producer, race Hobbs and so on. It's comforting. It's comforting to know virtual family or not that, that we're here for each other. And um, I just hope that you will all take that spirit with you um, tonight and moving forward. So please come back to KGRA for all the regular programming in the, the future uh, days ahead. If you want to go to Facebook and find Jeremy personally, you can go to Sky Island Storytelling. So at Sky Island Storytelling.
telling. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now. Thank you once again for tuning in. Join us next Tuesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on KGRRadio.com, your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. To find out more, you can go to KGRRadio.com and jump in the chat room, look for the telegraph, and sign up for news updates and KGR updates as well. And as usual, until next time, live in the mystery.